Hello, I'm Dr. Catherine Field, and I'm one of the co-PIs of the Apron team. My job in Apron is to lead the nutrition component of Apron, and in particular, I look after the biobank, which is where we store all the med all the samples that we've collected from our women. So this slide shows you the different measures we took of women during the apron uh, study. And what I want to focus on is some of the blood measures and the breast milk analysis. We looked at a number of different nutrients and their status in the apron cohort. And today I'm just going to give a bit of an update on uh, four of these nutrients, um, and that being folate, and the B vitamins, essential fatty acid status, choline, and iron. So if we start with folate and the B vitamins, and I'm there are many, many people involved in each of these studies, but I'm going to talk put on these slides primarily the lead graduate students who are involved. Folate, folic acid, and folicin are all different forms of the same vitamin. And it's a water-soluble vitamin involved in metabolism, um, particularly in synthesis. Humans can't make folate, so they have to depend on a source from their diet. It's critical in the first 28 days of development for the neural tube in the infant, and that will become the brain and spinal cord, and that's what we often think of in terms of folic acid as important during pregnancy. But it's also needed for mom for red blood cell synthesis, mental health, and the growth of both the fetus and the placenta. Folate. Um, has a number of biomarkers to look at status. And the one that I'm going to talk about today is the red blood cell folate concentration. And we have some clear concentrations that are have been identified as uh, putting women at risk for uh, neural tube defects. There are other markers of folate sufficiency that we have measured in apron or are measuring in apron. And I won't talk about them today. We published data on the red blood cell folate status in the apron women. There's four different levels of status that you can see across the bottom of this axis on the graph. Deficient, less than 305 nanomoles per liter. And you can see that very few of our women were deficient and only when in the first trimester in, there's a level of suboptimal, which is putting women at risk for potential uh, negative consequences such as uh, neural tube defects. And you can see that we have a quite a, a significant portion of women in the first trimester at risk that this decreases. The women in the reference range represent about 30% of our women. But what was most surprising in our study was the large number of our women that were in what we call the excess were above reference uh, levels. This slide demonstrates the reason why we may have seen such a high level of folate status in our women. This slide shows you the uh, average intake in micrograms per day. The recommendation for um, pregnancy is somewhere a little bit above the ear here, but this is the average, um, estimated average requirement. And the upper limit set that is a guide for women shouldn't exceed that. And as you can see from diet, um, again, much a very low intake, supplements, the second bar, the dotted bar, represents a very large intake of the folic acid. And the combination of diet and um, supplement is the third bar. So you can see that on average, our women across all trimesters and postpartum had intakes of folic acid above what's considered the upper limit. 
So what we learned from this was that overt folate deficiency was very rare. There's only a couple women in our first trimester. 24% of our women, though, had suboptimal red blood cell folate concentrations at the start of pregnancy. This group declined substantially um, in the second and third, but this is an area of, of great question whether there's any concern with having such a high amount of folate in their red blood cell. Women consuming folic acid supplements had high red blood cell folate and plasma folate concentrations. And vitamin B12 and B6 deficiency was also rare, and I didn't show the slide for that, but we did, we did not have very many women who had low status in either of those vitamins. But our work did question the appropriateness of current folic acid content in supplements for women who are healthy and not at risk for some of the uh, consequences of high folate deficiency. I want to move on now to the N3 fatty acids in maternal diet status and breast milk concentration. And the key graduate students are also indicated on this slide. There are a number of sources of the N3 or the omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. Docosahexaenoic acid, or what we call DHA, is a long-chain polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acid. For most of the population, the main source is synthesis from alpha-linolenic acid. The main preformed sources in the adult diet are from cold water fish and supplements and fortified foods. For the infant, DHA can be synthesized by the infant from the precursor fatty acid, alpha-linolenic acid, but it is provided in breast milk in fairly high concentration so that the infant doesn't have to do that. DHA is of great importance to the mom. There's an association between low DHA status and the risk of maternal depression. Experimental studies suggest benefits to placental health. Meta-analysis of studies conclude that maternal DHA supplementation was associated with an increase in the length of gestation, plus all the other health benefits that we know of uh, for DHA, such as a reduced risk of cancer, cardiovascular disease, insulin resistance, etc. A DHA supply is essential for the infant. One for brain and cognitive development, uh, DHA is deposited in the second half of gestation and this continues to accumulate postnatally. DHA status of mom and the infants is associated with improved cognitive development. Two, visual development. Structural components of the retinal lipids, which comprise as much as 50% of total rods and cones, um, are, is DHA and growth and development, and particularly development of the infants or the child's nervous system, but also immune development and a lower atopic disease risk. There have been some diet recommendations made for DHA during pregnancy and lactation. The consensus recommendations made by the EU Commission are the most uh, recent ones, and that was made from a whole group of different individuals who came together to discuss the current state of the science. And at that time, the recommendation for DHA during pregnancy and lactation was 200 milligrams a day. So what about our apron women? Well, this slide demonstrates the proportion of women who were below the recommended 200 milligrams. And you can see that this represents 70% um, uh, of our women across each trimester and postnatally. So the average intake from, of DHA from the diet was only 120 milligrams. So where were these women getting their, their DHA? Well, this looks at the categories of foods that contributed to the women's total long-chained N3 fatty acid intake. So that would be DHA and EPA, the other long chain. And as you can see with the blue here, that 78% was coming from the seafood and fish category. 
And if we broke that down even more within that, 61% of that was coming from salmon. And you can see the other sources um, around this uh, circle. This slide illustrates the variations in the DHA content in human milk between countries. This work was done in 2006, but there's been three studies since, and they found almost identical concentrations. What you can notice from this slide on the far left, Canada and the US have the lowest concentration of DHA in women's breast milk. The dotted lines represent the global mean and are generally used as reference ranges that we're looking for to try to get into formula or to get into mom's breast milk. Well, apron women have a low concentration of DHA in breast milk and the median uh, content is 0.26%, which is really not different from what was found in 2006. But we did find that women who took a supplement during um, lactation um, had a lower risk of not meeting current recommendations. And this was both during pregnancy and postpartum. And you can see the purple lines here represent the DHA supplement users who you can see are well above the current recommendation and the ones who didn't, who relied completely on diet, are well below. So what did this do to breast milk? Well, if we look at the supplemented versus the non-supplemented women, you can see that the content of breast milk was much higher. And this is actually in the reference range that we currently have for uh, breast milk and for infant formula supplementation. So what did we learn from APRIN? women about DHA status. Well, the dietary intake of DHA in the majority of women during pregnancy and lactation was well below current recommendations by the EU consensus group. It was also below what the recommendations would be if women had consumed three servings of fatty fish a week as part of their N3 intake, which is Health Canada's recommendation. The breast milk content of DHA in Albertan women was below the global average. And, but women who took a supplement containing DHA had a lower risk of not meeting current recommendations and had breast milk with the content of DHA in the global reference range. So let's talk about dietary choline. Well, choline is an essential nutrient and it comes in many different forms and is quite widespread, again, across our food supply. It's involved in cell membrane signaling, lipid transport, neurotransmitter synthesis, and in the production of the antioxidant, betaine. Choline is required in increased amounts during rapid periods of growth and development, such as pregnancy and lactation. It's essential for fetal brain development, for memory, for learning, for infant growth development, and maternal health. So we asked the question, how much choline are women consuming during pregnancy and lactation? This slide shows you the estimated total choline intake, which was actually quite a hard uh, nutrient to calculate because we had to create our own databases to estimate this. But what you can see is across the three trimesters and three months postpartum, women were consuming less choline than the dotted line. And the dotted line represents what we call the adequate intake, which is the intake that Health Canada suggests is uh, adequate to meet the demands during pregnancy and lactation. And that dairy, eggs, meat were the major food categories that contributed to total choline intake in pregnancy and lactation. And if you just look at this circle, the biggest square is dairy. Then the blue, we, if we're going clockwise, is eggs. Then we've got meat and poultry. So you can see that between dairy, eggs, meat and poultry, it's over half of the choline in the diet. 
we know that egg consumers, which is eggs are a very high source of choline, um, had on average a higher total choline intake, and that's illustrated in the pink, both during pregnancy and during lactation. What we learned from APRIN was less than 25% of women met daily choline recommendations during pregnancy and lactation. Dairy, red meat, poultry were the major food sources, and there are multiple forms of choline in the diet, and we spent a lot of time calculating those. Um, and we had one of the first studies that came out to talk about the different forms of choline that are found in the diet. Few women took supplements that contained choline, and when they did, that was a very, very small amount and didn't contribute very much to intake. Now I want to turn to the micronutrient iron, and this is primarily work that's being led by Dr. Rhonda Bell in my department at the University of Alberta. Iron deficiency during pregnancy results in a number of uh, negative outcomes, including prematurity, interuterine growth retardation, and low birth weight, developmental delays in the infant, and anemia in infancy. But it also has significant implications for the mother in that there's an increased risk of miscarriage, preterm labor and delivery, anemia, and all the symptoms that go with anemia, such as fatigue, susceptibility to infection, inability to work and care for children, heart failure, and in our interest in our study, an increased risk of postpartum depression. Iron status in North American women um, is not very good in that it, over 40% of the North American women enter pregnancy with less iron stores than optimal. And the way that we measure iron deficiency during pregnancy and women are screened for this is by looking at hemoglobin levels in the blood. And there are some reference ranges that are well defined. One of the problems with this measure is that it's done at a time where it tells you women are deficient, not that women are at risk. So it's harder for intervention. So one of the measures one might do is serum ferritin, which is a protein in blood that changes in relationship to stores. So people have better stores, they have more serum ferritin. This slide shows hemoglobin data from the APRIN cohort, and that's represented in the purple circles. And this is looking at the gestational age in months so during pregnancy. The green represents the data from the NHANE study, which is the big um, national study of the U.S. And you can see that our women have better hemoglobin status than the American women. But that's not to be unexpected in that our women were highly educated and high social economic status. But what is interesting is the serum ferritin, and this represents the stores. And what we're looking at here is A is the first trimester, B is the second trimester, and C is the third trimester. And you can see that the concentration of serum ferritin significantly decreases through pregnancy, indicating that women's stores are being used to provide sufficient iron for the fetus. This is another way of looking at maternal serum ferritin concentration. So what we've done is plotted every woman as a dot, and we plotted them at gestational age. And you can see in the first and second trimester, so that's up to 24 weeks, women are uh, come into apron at a wide range of different um, times in pregnancy where it's much tighter by the third trimester and postpartum. The red line represents the serum ferritin concentration that indicates below this is suboptimal iron stores. So if we look first at what is status across pregnancy, we're showing you virtually what you saw in the other slide, that it decreases significantly by the third trimester. But what we did look at were the women that fell below this line. And as you can see in the third trimester, 
61.7% of our women fell below the um, reference line for adequate iron stores. We've also done preliminary work on vitamin D status in our cohort. This is the work of Dr. Fariba Afajari, who's a MD, PhD in the Department of Family Medicine and Community Health Sciences at the University of Calgary. And much of this work she did during her PhD. We had an interesting correlation between maternal intake, and this includes diet and supplemental intake, and maternal status, and that as intake increases, status of vitamin D in our women increases. The current recommendations for vitamin D status are um, depending on whose you use, but if you use the most, um, the highest uh, status would be women who are under 75 nanomoles per liter would be considered at risk. We did find other vitamin D supplements that the current recommendations for vitamin D intake um, may not be adequate to achieve an optimal vitamin D status, so that may need to be rethought. Um, and we also found did some work on one of the small isoforms of vitamin D. And if you don't use one of the more high-tech uh, standards for measuring vitamin D, you're unable to separate this out. And if you can separate this out, you actually get a different status because this epimer seems to be higher, high during pregnancy, especially in women who are taking a lot of supplements. So what are we doing now? Well, there's lots of nutrition work currently going on in APRIN, and we're in the process of answering our key question in APRIN. It's examining the relationship between maternal mental health and nutrition status. We're determining maternal iron intake and status and the many different measures of status, so we might be able to propose better measures of identifying women at risk than a hemoglobin. We have looked at neurotoxin exposure and nutrition, and we're continuing that to look at how that may impact the children and the development of the children. We're studying N3 fatty acid uh, work and maternal and infant health. We're determining the importance of dairy in the maternal diet. And we're continuing to work on vitamin D status and infant health as we expand the number of women we are able to get vitamin D measures on. But I'd just like to end in saying that the APRIN cohort is the largest infant pregnancy nutrition cohort in the country and probably in the world. And we'll continue to provide information for many years to help improve the nutrition of mothers and infants and provide evidence for setting nutrition recommendations and policies for supplements. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of the students, um, both undergraduate, graduate, and postdoc trainees who've worked with us on the status measures. Um, the technicians and research assistants, most importantly, Susan Gorick and Yi Shen, and our collaborators, which is the whole APRIN team and a large group of collaborators outside of the main APRIN team. Plus, we've had funding and support not only from Alberta Innovates for setting up the cohort, but also from additional monies come in from CIHR, Dairy Farmers of Canada, the NIH, NSERC, and Alberta Innovates Biosolutions. And I'd be happy to take any questions at this time.